The Tolkien Road, Episode 134, The Lord of the Rings, Homeward Bound. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 6, Chapter 7, Homeward Bound. Before we get started, please head on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. You can also stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. Follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tolkien Road and on Twitter via at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, episode 134, book 6, chapter 7 of Lord of the Rings, Homeward Bound. Homeward Bound. We are bound for the home. Homeward Bound. I wish I was home. Did you not have that queued up? Oh, you kind of did. Oh. Where my thoughts escaping home, where the music's playing home, where my love lies waiting silently for me. It's one of my favorite Simon and Garfunkel songs. Definitely. You know, it's, um, there's a, I really do, like, that's, that's a great song. Like, that's an incredibly great song. That's an absolute classic. And, um. Of course, we don't we don't deal in anything when it comes to music, but absolute classics on the show. But like, that's truly one that I'm mm-hmm. like. That's just a phenomenal song. Like any songwriter, should want to have written that song. Agreed. It's, it's just it's like iconic, you know. How can the same? I I totally agree. But what baffles my mind is how this same like Homeward Bound and um, and yeah, uh, you're say Bridge Over Trouble. Yeah, Waters. I was just gonna say, how can the same genius who wrote Homeward Bound have also written Bridge Over Troubled Water? I know you don't like that and song. And Scarborough but I, Fair. Like, why? Well, Scarborough Fair is actually like a... Um, I know, it's like a folk tune. It's like an old folk tune. I know, but um, that doesn't make it any better. Are you Don't, no. Please, don't. don't. You know, the thing is, it's um, it's really Art Garfunkel that kind of like... Art Garfunkel... The, you, like, I, I don't mean to disrespect the guy and um, and, and be, off, you know, be awful to him or anything like that, but, but Paul Simon... Would, did the right thing by moving on by moving from Simon on. Garfunkel because you think about it he had he had an incre- he's had an incredible solo career I mean Grace oh, yeah. Land, Grace oh, Land yeah. alone yeah. that album alone is um, you know would make for anybody's solo career incredible but yes. then you you know tons of other great songs outside of that one album I mean you know just one of the great songwriters obviously and then you have Garfunkel and so it's you know poor Garfunkel he's like you know this kind of great like uh, you know what do you call it I guess it would be a um, What's the higher range for a man? Alto. Is it alto? Well, it's like the lower range for a woman. So yeah, I, he does, I mean, he has a pretty high voice yeah. for a guy, and yeah. so it's well, like tenor? mezzo alto or something like that, yeah. or tenor, like you know, high tenor, yeah. low alto, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, his voice has just never done it for me. Yeah. Like I like like Paul Simon, his voice is just a great like because he doesn't have a great voice. Nope. But he just he uses his voice so well in yeah. the context of the song. And his lyrics are just And and Garfunkel yeah. has that like more like classical kind of, you know, range and it's yeah. very emotive. Ah. Uh, and yeah. I don't know, I just I've never never been a fan of his voice and you know, in both of those songs he plays an important role. Oh, in the and Bridge Over Trouble Water. But like on Homeward Bound, the famous version, like the, the there, there's the studio version of Homeward Bound and then there's a um uh and then there is a uh, non-studio version. There's like a live version of it. That's that's the one I was most familiar with, and I actually prefer the live, the live version of it um, much more. Let's see here. Which one is on the Forrest Gump soundtrack? It's that's Mrs. Robinson. That wasn't. Oh, yeah. My bad. That's another great. Sorry, and Garfunkel. Yeah, we go. Oh, yeah, it is. Well, yeah. But again, it doesn't put our Gar Garfunkel up front and center, right? Mrs. Robinson doesn't. Right. Maybe, okay. Like, I think you figured it out. I think you figured out why I like some Simon and Garfunkel songs and why I don't like I mean, them. um, mm-hmm. so it's funny, though. I'm looking through this, like, you know, this is their original Greatest Hits, and it's like, 
I, I like think about like the songs that I would stop and listen to and the songs that I would skip. Mm-hmm. And you know, like Mrs. Robinson again. I feel like Paul Simon. Like they both sing on it. They both sing on all the songs. But yeah. Mrs. Robinson, Paul Simon's voice is much more prominent. He's right. the lead, right? right. For Emily, wherever I'm, I can't even, I don't even know how that song goes. For Emily, wherever. But I know I it's an Art Garfunkel her. song because I always, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't bother to listen to it. Mm-hmm. Or it's, I, I think Paul Simon wrote most of the songs anyway, even if Garfunkel sang them. Um, but then there's the Boxer, uh, Feeling Groovy, uh, Sound of Silence, um, you know, like, and then Homeward Bound, America, like uh, Cecilia, those like those are Paul Simon singing those mm-hmm. songs in my mind, you know, not yeah. not Garfunkel. So it's like, uh, you know, <laughs> props to Garfunkel for you know having a great voice and for doing a good job on like providing harmony on their best right. stuff. Right, 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 yeah. But um, you know. Paul never, Simon's never been a fan of his at. stuff. I know there's, but you know, there's probably there's lots of people out there who probably do love his stuff. So no, it's true. That's your thing. There's also That's a lot cool. of people out there that love Josh Groban. Well, you like, know? why did you have to bring Josh Groban into this? I actually like Josh Groban. Yeah, what are we doing? This is a Tolkien. I know podcast. we're a little so off. About we're a little Garfunkel off this little morning. Time. Must uh, be the snow. Special thanks to our executive producers, Dr. William Hutton and Justine Lloyd, as well as our other generous patrons. If you'd like to contribute be a patron head on over to tolkienroad.com or patreon.com slash tolkienroad to learn more um yeah so book six chapter seven three chapters to go oh all my right gosh. two chapters after this week and um Crazy. and yeah we're homeward bound so why don't we uh not a lot going on in this chapter <laughs> this is a bit, maybe this, that's why we uh this is the most uneventful chapter in the entire book yeah. by far right yeah it yes Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> thankfully, I'm like, it was, trying to think about something I'd say about it. And I'm just like, uh, well, thankfully it was short. Um, and then I mean, some interesting stuff happens again. Like I, you know, this is, this is a reason like I like Tolkien is cause he doesn't rush through things. Right. And he stops to like have these quieter moments and, these and you need those things where people are talking. Way too yeah. Stressful yeah. I feel like so much, kind of I feel like so chapters. much storytelling. I think about like, um, like movies I love and what am I doing? What are you pointing I at? I just need a napkin, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I think about movies I love. By the way, if you want to eat your toast, that's fine. Thanks. Just warning that <laughs> Gre- Greta is just eating breakfast, so, you know, she's going to be eating yeah. toast. I told her not to, I, don't, I told her to chew nicely and not to chew close to the yeah, microphone. Yeah, I'll so. try to be quiet. Mm. But I told John, I'm sure the Inklings had tea and toast while they had their discussion, so it doesn't seem wholly inappropriate for me to eat toast. You're darn right they did. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Might as well just call them the toastlings. Now, if I were eating like a barbecue sandwich and a beer, that would be different. Well, beer may be okay, but barbecue, not quite as appropriate. Anyway, I digress. Okay. Speaking of beer. Um, All right. Um, speaking of beer. What? Speaking of beer, I was just gonna say, speaking of beer, that they, um, you know, the tavern is kind of where this whole chapter <laughs> takes place. Tavern uh, and the beer and beers having the taverns. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Prancing pony. But I was going to make the point that in a chapter like this, yeah, this is what I appreciate so much about Tolkien. And even when I'm watching movies, like I like, I like when there is a good balance of quieter moments. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a problem I have in general with more contemporary movies. If I go, even if I go back to like the '80s or even maybe the '90s, like they feel like there's lots more movies. Even the big blockbusters had their quieter moments in them, and I value those so much. Mm I realize, and now it just seems like everything is like one from it just jumps from one action sequence to the next, you know, and I'm like, and that could be exhausting. It is. It's mentally, it's mentally exhausting and visually exhausting, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I just think about like a movie like um, The Karate Kid, huge, huge mm-hmm. success, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got like, you know, you've got these like iconic fight scenes and everything, but then you have these like quieter scenes, and you know, we're trying um, to catch the fly with the chopsticks. Yeah, yeah, you know, just mm-hmm. these like. These like simpler, simpler moments, or you have the moment where he's like, you know, the moments where they're training and every, you know, where he's like the wax on, wax off, or you yeah, know, um, or even the part where he's like they're training on the beach and they've got the mm-hmm. nice, beautiful music. Maybe it's part of it's just the music is incredible in that scene too. But um, anyway, uh, all that is to say, I like the quieter moments. No, I do too. Um, I do too. I feel like that's one of the things that makes Tolkien's works one of a kind. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, stand out. So yeah. anyway. Um, we're picking up with the 6th of October, all right? So they've just, they've left Rivendell now on their way back to the Shire, and it is October the 6th, 
And October the 6th turns out to be the one year anniversary of the day that Frodo was stabbed. Right. Right. Frodo was stabbed by the Morgul blade on Weathertop. And um, so why don't you read this? Why don't you read this first little section here? At last? Yeah. At last, the hobbits had their faces turned towards home. They were eager now to see the Shire again, but at first they rode only slowly, for Frodo had been ill at ease. When they came to the ford of Bruinen, he had halted and seemed loth to ride into the stream. And they noted that for a while his eyes appeared not to see them or things about him. All that day he was silent. It was the 6th of October. "'Are you in pain, Frodo?' said Gandalf quietly, as he rode by Frodo's side. "'Well, yes, I am,' said Frodo. "'It is my shoulder. The wound aches, and the memory of darkness is heavy on me. It was a year ago today.' "'Alas, there are some wounds that cannot be wholly cured,' said Gandalf. "'I fear it may be so with mine,' said Frodo. "'There is no real going back. Though I may come to the Shire, it will not seem the same, for I shall not be the same.' I am wounded with knife, sting, and tooth, and a long burden. Where shall I find rest? Gandalf did not answer. Yeah, so, um, you know, that statement by Frodo right there really sets the tone for the last three chapters of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and for, uh, you know, kind of the end of Frodo's story, right? That he is, even though he's triumphed, mm -hmm. right? Even though mm -hmm. ultimately he, he, his quest to destroy the ring was successful, um, He's not the same. He's changed. And the Shire will never be the same for him. He's wounded by knife, sting, and tooth. So, you know, the, the Morgul blade, um, the uh, the sting of Shelob, and then mm. the tooth of Gollum, right? Biting off his, right. biting off his finger. Yes, and, yes. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's damaged, right? Mm -hmm. uh, very, very heavily damaged mm -hmm. and a long burden, right? That's the thing that finishes it off, the carrying of the burden of the ring over all that distance for, you know, for a year, yeah. really took a real toll for, for close to a year yeah and this always kind of strikes me as a bit um yeah, like it makes me sad because you think about everything he's been through and you're you know they finally destroy the ring and you just think it's going to be lollipops and daisies and blue sky you know mm -hmm. like the deed is done and everything's going to be on the up and up right but clearly it's not right you know so yeah. i'm always a, just this you know that realization always makes me sad to be like this is, it shouldn't be this way Mm -hmm. You know, like he should be able to just shake this all off and go back. But the truth is, none of us can go back, right? I yeah. Mean, well, you think about even a, even soldiers coming home uh, yeah. from war. Even if mm -hmm. you know, you take the case of let's let's take the case of soldiers who fought in World War Two, mm -hmm. a, a, a one an amazing victory, you know, for yes. for Allied soldiers, right? For yes. U.S. soldiers, um, and uh, you know, a real triumph. You know, you see the pictures of the end of the war, and it's all these celebrations and and uh, happy times because mm -hmm. the war is over mm -hmm. and it's victorious, unconditional uh, victory. Mm -hmm. And but even so, they carry with them the soldiers who survived. Many carried with them injuries, mm -hmm. right? Things you know, probably many of them had, had been shot at different times, had mm -hmm. maybe lost limbs or you know different parts of their bodies mm -hmm. um but the m emotional and spiritual scars too of seeing of a of seeing your your comrades right your your fellow soldiers killed mm -hmm. right yeah and and then of seeing and then the additional horror of realizing that you probably as you have even though it was maybe done in, justly in the sense of defending your own life and defending the life of your fellow soldiers that you'd killed others, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That takes a toll on a person, yeah. right? Even oh, if it's absolutely. done, even if it's done justly, right? Absolutely. Um, it's yeah. still not some. It's still not an ideal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It still shows the the darkness of this world. It's a it's a you know it's a real moment of the darkness of the world we live in. Yeah. Um, You're right. You're right. So, <clears throat> um, so it's understandable that Frodo is feeling these things. Yes, it is. It is. I mean, it's still sad. Yeah. But it is understandable and you like to think that time will you know i mean i know gandalf says here there are some wounds that you know will that will that cannot be wholly cured and i realize that those exist but i think time does ease the pain and the burden yeah of many many trials yeah well 
So they're crossing the Fort, the Bruinen River, which is, um, you know, that's where, when they, when, right after, when, um, at the end of the first book of, mm-hmm. in Fellowship, uh, where Frodo basically, um, you know, he, he loses consciousness, and who is it? I think it's, um, that, well, they have to call the, see, I get the movie scene, because it's Arwen in the movie, but it's not, that's not how it happens in the book, but uh, they have, they call down the, the waters, the flood waters, to stop the night, to stop the Nazgul. Right. right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so that's that's kind of like a moment, a, a major moment for Frodo, where he he passes out from mm-hmm. the knife wound, and they almost lose him. Right. 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 So, yes. Um, so it's interesting that 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 he's starting to feel this right here, right mm-hmm. at the Fort of Ruin. And, that's a trigger. Yep. So um, and you know later um, as they continue their journey uh, to the west. They pass Weathertop, um, which of course was where he was stabbed, mm-hmm. and eventually they come to uh, Bree, and they come to the Bree Gate. And you know, for them, they're thinking, "Oh, we've just, you know, the king is back, right? The mm-hmm. king has returned to Gondor. Um, he's he's in the process of setting all things right, and uh, so." We should expect that Bree is going to be a happy place, and when we get back to the Shire, it's going to be a happy place, and we're going to have lots of things to tell people, right? Like, yes. you, know, you know, we're going to have great stories to tell, and it's going to be all fun and celebration and all these sorts of things. They're expecting a hero's welcome. Maybe, maybe not a hero's welcome, but at least to find these places happy, right? Mm-hmm. You know, or, or at least how they Find the darkness were. lifted. Right. Yeah. But what we find is they come back to Bree, and it's, it's actually a darker place than when they left. Yes. You know, so, so Brie is not necessarily a happy place. Um, all right, so they walk up, they come, they approach the Brie Gate, um, and uh, when they had called many times, at last the gatekeeper came out, and they saw that he carried a great cudgel. He looked at them with fear and suspicion, but when he saw that Gandalf was there and that his companions were hobbits in spite of their strange gear, then he brightened and wished them welcome. Come in, he said, unlocking the gate. We won't stay for news out here in the cold and the wet, a ruffianly evening. But old Bar- excuse me, but old Barley will no doubt give you a welcome at the pony, and there you'll hear all there is to hear. And there there you'll hear later all that we say and more, laughed Gandalf. How is Harry? The gatekeeper scowled. Gone, he said. But you best gasp Barleyman. Good evening. Good evening to you, they said, and passed through. And then they noticed that behind the hedge at the roadside a long low hut had been built and a number of men had come out and were staring at them over the fence. When they came to Bill Fernie's house, they saw that the hedge there was tattered and unkempt, and the windows were all boarded up. "'Do you think you killed him with that apple, Sam?' said Pippin. "'I'm not so hopeful, Mr. Pippin,' said Sam, "'but I'd like to know what became of that poor pony. "'He's been on my mind many a time, and the wolves howling and all.'" Um, so, you know, they've got this strange little hut built there. There's this fella Harry, who I don't think we, we know, Mm-hmm. is not there as Gandalf expects him to be. Right. And then Bill Fernie, who you'll remember, Bill Fernie was the kind of shady shady guy yes. from Bree, mm-hmm. uh, who Sam had thrown the apple at um, and hit him in the head right. when they were leaving. Right. Um, not, a, not a good guy, and so he's nowhere to be seen either. All right, so they, they do, they go to the Prancing Pony, they find um, Mr. Butterbur, Barlaman Butterbur, and uh, they start having a conversation with him. Um, and, uh, and then he, you know, they, they kind of get further and further in and they realize that there's not first, the first bad sign really is that there's not any, uh, tobacco, good tobacco to be had. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, if you call for anything else, I'd have, I'd have been happier, said Butterbur. That's just a thing that we're short of seeing how we've only got what we grow ourselves. And that's not enough. There's none to be had from the Shire these days, but I'll do what I can. Um, so that's you know, first interesting note that, you know, something pretty tangible something is, is off. Something is amiss, yes. Something is amiss. Um, they go on, they're catching up on Bree, and Butterbur talks about this recent unpleasantness that they've experienced here in Bree. Oh, yeah. All right, but he did not say much on his own account. Things were far from well, he would say. Business was not even fair. It was downright bad. No one comes nigh Bree now from outside, he said, and the inside folks... They stay at home mostly and keep their doors barred. It all comes of those newcomers and gangrels that began coming up the Greenway last year, as you may remember. But more came later. Some were just poor bodies running away from trouble. 
but most were bad men, full of thievery and mischief. And there, were trou there was trouble right here in Bree, bad trouble. Why, we had a real set to, and there were some folk killed. Killed dead, if you'll believe me. Killed dead. <laughs> <laughs> funny way of speaking. It is funny. I will indeed, said Gandalf. How many? Three and two, said Butterbur, referring to the big folk and the little. There was poor Miss Matt Heathertoes and Rowley Appledore and little Tom Pickthorn from over the hill. And Willie Banks from up, from up away, and one of the underhills from Staddle, all good fellows, and they're missed. And Harry Goatleaf that used to be on the west gate, and that Bill Fernie, they came in on the stranger's side, and they've gone off with them, and it's my belief they let them in. On the night of the fight, I mean. And that was after we showed them the gates and pushed them out. Before the year's end, that was. And the fight was early in the new year, after the heavy snow we had. And now they're gone for robbers and live outside, hiding in the woods beyond Arkett, and out in the wilds, Northway. It's like a bit of the bad old times tales tell of, I say. It isn't safe on the road, and nobody goes far, and folk lock up early. We have to keep watchers all around the fence and put a lot of men out on the gates at night. So, um, so yeah, things are, you know, things not are not good, good in Bree. Um, you know, several, there was a little, uh, un, you know, people coming up from the south. Um, Who are these people? Well, we don't know yet. We don't oh, know okay. yet, right? We, all we know is that they came up, and we, we it seems to have something to do with... Uh, maybe the departure of the rangers, right? So the rangers had been mm. kind of the, the force that kept the peace right, right. in this area okay. for a long time. And, of course, Aragorn has been with mm -hmm. has been with um, uh, the hobbits right. since, um, you know, since that time. And, you know, we're not sure what the other rangers have been doing, except for later on, a little bit later on, when they came down and uh, joined the forces at Gondor mm -hmm. at, the battle, at uh, the Battle of Pelennor Fields. Right. So, um... But we've had some folks die, and then we've had Bill Fernie and this Harry Goatleaf have both joined forces with these thieves these and strangers. robbers who came up from the south. Right. Right. Um, let's see. So, um, so Gandalf, uh, Gandalf laughs, kind of uh, laughs at all this, and says, "Well, well, if they were afraid of just five of us, so they're referring to the fact that they're, you know, people are a little more on edge right now, and they're kind of afraid of these guys that come up these." This big wizard and then the four hobbits that come up armed, you know, mm -hmm. looking like they're armed for battle. Mm -hmm. He says, well, well, if they're afraid of just five of us, then we have met worse enemies on our travels. But at any rate, they will give you peace at night while we stay. How long will that be, said Butterbur? I'll not deny we should be glad to have you about for a bit. You see, we're not used to such troubles, and the rangers have all gone away, folk tell me. I don't think we rightly understood till now what they did for us. For there's been worse than robbers about. Wolves were howling around the fence last winter. And there's dark shapes in the woods, dreadful things that it makes the blood run cold to think of. It's been very disturbing, if you understand me. I expect it has, said Gandalf. Nearly all lands have been disturbed these days, very disturbed. But cheer up, Barlaman. You have been on the edge of very great troubles, and I am only glad to hear that you have not been deeper in. But better times are coming. Maybe better than any you remember. The rangers have returned. We, come ba we came back with them, and there is a king again, Barlaman. He will soon be turning his mind this way. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. Not only do we have these bad guys, but we have the wolves, and then we have this, you know, mysterious, uh, evil, you know, kind of scary monsters lurking in the woods, yeah. right, that we yeah. don't know uh, much about other than that. So, yeah, not a, it, not a very happy place, but the good news, Gandalf says, is that the king has returned, mm -hmm. um, and, of course, Barlaman gets to the point of asking, well, who's the king? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and it's, I think it's Sam that shares the news with him. Let's see. Yeah. yeah it is. Oh, here it's we Sam. go. Yeah. Uh, does he now? Though I'm sure I don't know why he should, sitting in his big chair up in his great castle. And they're, they're saying so, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the king, you know, that the king loves Bree. He knows Bree and mm -hmm. he loves Bree. And, you know, Butterbur's a little right. surprised by this. Yeah. Does he now? Though I'm sure I don't know why he should, sitting in his big chair up in his great castle hundreds of miles away, and drinking wine out of a golden cup, I shouldn't wonder. What's the point to Pony? To, what's, what's the pony to him? Or mugs of beer? Not but what my beer is good, Gandalf. It's been uncommon good since you came in the autumn of last year and put a good word on it. And that's been a comfort and trouble, I will say. Ah, said Sam. But he says your beer is always good. He says... Of course he does. He's Strider, the chief of the of the rangers. Haven't you got that into your head yet? Okay, why does he ask? Like, what should have tipped him off? 
Why, why does, why do they get, why do they expect, why does Sam expect here that Butterbur should have figured out by this point that Strider was the king? Do you know what I'm saying? Well, he would, I mean, Butterbur would have known Strider, right? He... Well, yeah, he would have, but what, I guess when I, when Sam says, um, haven't you got that into your head yet? I was kind of like, well, what? He's, he's, you guys he's... haven't said anything that even alluded to the well, fact the... that it might be Strider, well, except yeah, the he... fact that he knows Bree. Well, exactly. yeah, lots of people know Bree. Yeah. Right? And there was nothing about him when he was in, nothing about Strider when he was in Bree that would say, oh, that must be the future king right there. I mean, he was totally in disguise. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I'm probably just making too much of this, but I was a little annoyed it's with Sam. It's just Sam being Sam, right? I know, but I was like, give the guy a break. Like, you, like, what, do you expect him to be able to read your mind? I mean, there's no reason he should know that Strider is the king. It's kind of, it, I think it's just the excitement, like, of sharing that news. Oh, maybe. You know, of sharing news, and it's like... You know, you, you're just being, you know, you're excited and you're like, yeah. don't you know yet? You know, it's, I don't think it's, I don't think he's giving him like a hard time. I don't think he's okay. trying to make him feel like a, an idiot. I think he's okay. just saying like, you know, haven't you figured it out yet? You know? Yeah. It's great news. It's Strider. He's the king. Right? I see. That's cool. You know, I mean, that's exciting no, it news is for them. Cool. I mean, not only is there yeah. a king, but you, yeah. you know the king personally. Right. That's pretty awesome. That is really awesome. No, that is There's super, nothing. There's probably awesome. nothing, like no bigger deal for these people than to know the king yeah. personally. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. But it just kind of threw me for a loop. So I was like, what? How, why? Why should he have known? Anyway. Well, to this, uh, Butterbur, um, Butterbur so suddenly realizes it and says, Strider, him with a crown and all and a golden cup. Well, what are we coming to? Better times for Bree at any rate, said Gandalf. I hope so, I'm sure, said Butterbur. Well, this has been the nicest chat I've had in a month of Mondays. And I'll not deny that I'll sleep easier tonight and with a lighter heart. You've given me a powerful lot to think over, but I'll put that off until tomorrow. I'm for bed, and I've no doubt you'll be glad of your beds, too. Hey, Nob, he called, going to the door. Nob, you slow coach. Nob, he said to himself, slapping his forehead. Now what does that remind me of? Um, not another letter you've forgotten, I hope, Mr. Butterbur, said Mary. Now, now, Mr. Brandybuck, don't go reminding me of that. But there, you've broken my thought. Now where was I? Nob, stables, ah! That was it. I have something that belongs to you. If you recollect, Bill Fernie and the horse thieving. His pony, as you bought, well, it's here. Come back, all of, us, all of itself it did. But where it had been to, you know better than me. It was as shaggy as an old dog and as lean as a clothes rail, but it was alive. Nobs looked after it. What? My Bill, cried Sam. Well, I was born lucky, whatever my gaffer may say. There's another which come true. Where is he? Sam would not go to bed until he had visited Bill in his stable. So that's like the. That's the high point of the chapter. That's, the, that's well. That's the cherry on top of the. Mm -hmm. uh, is everything sad going to come untrue? Right. <laughs> that's true. Right? That's absolutely true. I mean, you know. Yeah. And I love what Sam says. Well, I was born lucky. Whatever my gaffer may say. <laughs> <laughs> you just hear. Yeah. You just hear uh, the gaffer telling Sam all the time when he was growing up, like, Sam, you have you have the luck of a you know something mm -hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. You were born with the luck of a, of a. Two leaf clover or something like that. Right, right. I'm not good at coming up with that kind of stuff. I don't yeah, know what has bad luck. What, about, what is bad luck? You were born with the, you were born with the bad luck of a black cat with a ladder on its back. There you go. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. I was just gonna say that 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 little um, that little word from Sam reminded me of something that your dad always says. He always says something like, "Well, I don't care what everybody says about you. Yeah. I think you're a nice person," or yeah. something like that. Or, I don't care what all the people say. Yeah. I think you're... No, it's it, how it goes is, well, I I think, uh, well, I think you're, I think you're real smart, no, ma no matter what, you know, so-and-so says no, about you. No, so what so-and-so says, yes. <laughs> well, I don't care what all those other people say about you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sam. Yeah. He needed that. I'm glad. Oh, yeah. Bill's been reunited. Like I said, it's the cherry on top. The cherry on top. All sad things of, coming untrue. Yes, and all yeah. sad, all sad things coming untrue Sunday. Mm-hmm. With extra whipped cream. With extra whipped cream, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, so they head on, so, you know, eventually they head on, they stayed, and, um, they stayed and breathe all the next day, um, and, you know, Frodo's asked if he's writing a book about it, um, and he says, I'm going home to put my notes in order. Um, let's see, so, so, um, as they're leaving, Butterbur says to them, 
Well, good luck on your road and good luck to your homecoming. I should have warned you before that all is not well in the Shire, neither, if what we hear is true. You know, it's, this is a very Butterbird thing to do. It's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, one last thing. Oh yeah. Things aren't pr very good in the yeah, Shire. Yeah, I meant You're... to tell you sooner, yeah. mm, but it kind of slipped my mind. Sorry about that. Yeah. Funny things going on, they say, but one thing drives out another, and I was at full of my own troubles. But if I, may, if I may be so bold, you've come back changed from your travels, and you look now like folk as can deal with troubles out of hand. I don't doubt you'll soon set all to rights. Good luck to you, and the oftener you come back, the better I'll be pleased. So, all's not well in the Shire. Yeah. They hear it now. Which they, you know, Frodo and I think especially Sam have been kind of feeling like, all right, we need to get home, we need to get home. Like, they've had, I think, some kind of inkling that the sooner they can return, the better. Well, he already told them there's something wrong with the south farthing, right? right. Which is the, you But know, even before this, like, even when they were, you know, in the chapters previous, they, they had made comments, the fact that they had a bad feeling about the state of the Shire. Right. So that, I'm sure this doesn't, this is, doesn't surprise them. Well... I mean, I, yeah, it doesn't surprise. It's not a complete shock, but they already knew something was wrong with the South Farthing from the mm -hmm. tobacco from the right. tobacco problem. Right. And um, and then Sam hints at, you know, that well, he saw these things in the mirror, right? He's when he, he looked did. in the mirror, he saw. I'm things. saying even before this, like when they were Why? traveling. No, oh, they were just been random comments about how they were felt like they needed to get home sooner rather than later. Like in previous chapters that we've talked about, Sam has made a couple of comments about he's worried about the gaffer okay. and he feels like things aren't aren't right and you know how you get like those, but where does like, that well yeah inclination but i'm saying he he looked in the mirror right, Galadriel, he didn't look at, and no, that, i think true. that probably planted that seed of it probably concern did. in his mind right it probably did because yeah. the temptation for sam was to want to turn back and go home to the shire mm -hmm. right that that was where his heart lay and right. so he want you know he's been wanting to go back to the shire ever mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. um you know so you know, I, I think that's where that those inklings came from, right? It's gotcha. sense, until because that's the last thing you've seen. Mm -hmm. You want to know for sure that it's safe and happy there, right? Yes. You want to lay lay your own eyes on it to make sure that everything's okay. Right, right. absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. Um. So, um. Okay. Whatever it is, said Pippin. Lotho will be at the bottom of it. You can be sure of that. Who is that? Lotho is. Uh, I think he's. Frodo's cousin, isn't that right? Uh, the Sackville, Sackville Bagginses, right? Oh, okay. The ones that Bilbo didn't like that. Yeah, they're always trying to like take his take stuff. His stuff. Or, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, hold on. Where is the? No, it's okay. I was just wondering. I knew it had to be someone like that. I just couldn't remember exactly who it was. Here we go. Um. Yeah, Baggins. Okay, so we've got. If you look in the appendix, you've got all the, um, in appendix C, you've got all the family trees of the hobbits. So, Bilbo, alright, you've got Bilbo's, the son of Bungo and Belladonna, and then uh, Bungo's brother is Longo, and he married Camellia Sackville. Mm -hmm. And so that's the Otho Sackville Baggins, and then mm -hmm. Lobelia Bracegirdle. And then their son is Lotho, right? Yeah. So it's like Frodo's, where's Frodo on here? Frodo, Frodo, Frodo. There we go. Frodo is the, Frodo's like the second cousin. Oh, okay. Or like third cousin of, of, um, of Bilbo, third cousin once removed. So Frodo would be like, Frodo and Lotho would be like third or fourth cousins or something like that. I see. So, okay. Um. But yeah, Lotho is the son of uh, Lobelia. L Lobelia, I think that's what I said. Sackville Baggins. Yeah, that's right. Who was correct. the one that's always trying to steal from Bilbo. Got it. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, yeah, Lobelia. Okay. And Saruman says, well, he's probably deep in it. I mean, not Saruman. Gandalf. Mm -hmm. He says, yeah, he's probably involved, but he thinks it's Saruman. Yeah, he said, you've forgotten like... Saruman. He began right. to take an interest in the Shire before Mordor did. Well, we've got you with us, said Mary, so things will soon be cleared up. I am with you at present, but soon I shall not be. I am not coming to the Shire. You must settle its affairs yourselves. That is what you have been trained for. Do you not yet understand? My time is over. It is no longer my task to set things to rights, nor to help folk to do so. And as for you, my dear friends, you will need no help. You are grown up now, grown indeed very high among the great you are. And I have no longer any fear at all for any of you. 
But if you would know, I am turning aside soon. I am going to have a long talk with Bombadil. Such a talk as I have not had in all my time. He is a moss gatherer, and I have been a stone doomed to rolling. But my rolling days are ending, and now we shall have much, much to say to one another. So Gandalf is not going with him to the Shire. And right. Basically, his reason for that is that my, my work is done. Mm -hmm. I've, you remember, what did the wizards come for, right? They to did, help, to empower, right? To empower, um, not yeah. to be the leaders, right. right? Right. But to kind of marshal yeah. the forces. To train and train yeah. And train the free peoples of Middle-earth to resist Sauron. Right. Right. Yep. And so Gandalf says, my work in that regard is done. Right. Uh, and if the hobbits have to be thinking to themselves, wait a minute, you're telling us there's probably a wizard at the bottom of all this and you're not going to come with us. This is Saruman we're talking about. This right. Is, this is a Maiar. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. This is not a, uh, you know, th this is, this is not some orc. Right. right that we're talking about. This right. is a, this is someone of your stature, Gandalf. Um, they don't put up a, they don't protest though. He, Gandalf says, I'm going to go hang out with Tom Bombadil. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, Gandalf's not going to be right there, but he is, he's going to be hanging out with Tom Bombadil. So I'm sure if push came to shove and he needed to come over there, he could come over there and help. Right. So, you know, they may not be too worried about it. Yeah. I am kind of surprised they didn't put up more of a, I mean, they yeah. probably knew it was, it was pointless. They knew Gandalf well enough at this point to be like, yeah, it's not going to do any good for us to have a pity party and try to talk him out of it. He's made up his mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So off Gandalf goes. Off Gandalf goes. Um, as he, you know, so they, he departs into the Barrow Downs. Um, and so they look out over the Barrow Downs in a deep vale over the for old forest far away. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Frodo says, I should dearly like to see the old fellow again. And I guess he's referring to Bombadil. Mm -hmm. I wonder how he's getting on. Um, as well as ever, you may be sure. So, so I guess Gandalf hasn't departed quite yet. Yeah. Quite untroubled, and I should guess, not much interested in anything that we have done or seen, unless perhaps in our visits to the Ents. There may be a time later for you to go and see him. But if I were you, I should press on now for home, or you will not come to the Brandywine Bridge before the gates are locked. But there aren't any gates, said Mary. Not on the road, you know that quite well. There's the Buckland Gate, of course, but they'll let me through that at any time. There weren't any, ga there weren't any gates, you mean, said Gandalf. I think you will find some now, and you might have more trouble even at the Buckland Gate than you think. But you'll manage all right. Goodbye, dear friends. Not for the last time. Not yet. Goodbye. He turned Shadowfax off the road, and the great horse leaped the green dyke that here ran beside it. And then, at a cry from Gandalf, he was gone, racing toward the Barrow Downs like a wind from the north. Well, here we are, just the four of us that started out together, said Mary. We have left all the rest behind, one after another. It seems almost like a dream that has slowly faded. Not to me, said Frodo. To me, it feels more like falling asleep again. All right, so the end of Homeward Bound. Any final thoughts on that chapter? I don't know. All right. I don't think so. Two chapters to go. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right. I Without can further ado, yes. Let's do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. Boom. All right. Drop the mic. Rock. Oh, yeah. I always forget about the rock, rock paper, paper, scissors, shoot. shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I'm gonna go first. Cause I won! Alright, here's my haiku. Okay. What? Cause I sound like a little, uh, little sweet. Oh yeah, <laughs> a little sweet. Oh man, I love those commercials. Yeah. Alright, <clears throat> here's my haiku. Heading home. Hobbits share news, drink beer. Bill joins. Tom draws Gandalf away. Bill joins? Yeah, Bill. The pony Bill. Oh, Bill the pony. Okay. Bill joins and Tom draws Gandalf away. Right on. Yeah. Good job. Nah, you don't have to lie. I liked it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I was feeling rather uninspired. This chapter really didn't do stuff much happened, for me. Stuff happened. More stuff yeah, happened. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that was kind of it. I was like, uh. Anyways. All right, your turn. 
War is past, yet all is not happy in Bree, nor the Shire. Gandalf says goodbye. Hmm. Good. That was way better than mine. Well, I don't know. I liked it. I liked it a lot. We got any others? Yes, we have oh, cool. some from Josh. Right on. Um, Josh says, morning, Carswell. I hope everything is going well. I just wanted to say that in addition to Tolkien, to the Tolkien artist and illustrator, that I have added three other books to my Tolkien library. Right on. The Tolkien Reader. The Treason of Isengard, History of Middle-Earth, Part 2. The War of the Ring, History of Middle-Earth, Part 3. My library is slowly but surely growing, and I'm hoping to add John's latest book when it releases. He says, might it be on the Persona and Trials of Melkor. Ooh. Mm. Melkor, Melkor actually play is, uh, is a very important figure in the book. So, it'll yeah, announcement coming soon. I've been... Working hard, trying to finish it up. The hardest part of it's, writing a book is finishing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, so I'm sure. Start, I mean, I've never written a book, but I can imagine. You start out and you're like, you know, the fun part is like doing all the initial stuff where you're like, you got all these ideas and you're getting them down on paper mm -hmm. and then you've got to edit it down and you've got to, you've got to figure out like what's the stuff that really rounds it out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and makes it good. Um, but as I'm getting there, I'll, I'll share some initial thoughts on it. So, and... and and, and, I, and I really, I'm trying to have an announcement out actually this month on it. Um, but I'll say that um, it's going to be significantly longer, probably twice the length of Tolkien's Requiem. Oh. And, um, and it's going to cover a lot of different stuff from the history of Middle Earth. Mm -hmm. A lot of different aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, first Age, Third Age, Pre-First Age... Um, so it's, it looks at a whole lot of, a whole lot of different stuff. And, um, and I'm very, like, I'm just very increasingly proud of it as I, mm -hmm. as I write it. So I think it's a, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it. So awesome. I know that's me hyping Yay. my own book. It's, it's been, it's exciting. fun to write and it's, you know, so working on finishing it and hoping to have an announcement this very month. Yay. So, All right. Yeah. Something to look forward to. Right. All right. Um, did you want to add something? Because you got a book out. Or can I go ahead and read no, ahead. Josh's haiku? Okay, here's Josh's haiku for Homeward Bound. A promise of peace and commerce to... Jeez, oh, I'm going to butcher this. Okay. Eriador? Is that right? A promise er, of Ariador. peace... Eriador. Eriador. How, how about you read it? Let's do that. <laughs> a promise of peace and commerce to Eriador strike strides along soon nice Ariador is this northern is the northern region right oh okay oh, so okay. they talk about the king hasn't had a chance to put things right in right. Ariador but he's going to turn his mind this way soon. exactly yeah, so okay. he, the play on words he's going to it's going to stride stride strider nice. Yes. nice he says this haiku just came to me though at first i wrote anarion instead of Eri how do you say it again Ariador. Ariador, which i thought was both puzzling and humorous. All Gondorian slash Numenorian names sound alike in my head. Anarion, am I saying that right? Anarion? Anarion. Anarion was the younger brother of Isildur. Arnor, which was probably the name in my head, is the name of the province governed by Elendil, opposite Gondor. Eriador is the region of Middle Earth where you find the Shire, Arnor, etc. Basically everything east of the Misty Mountains. That clever Josh. He never disappoints. Yeah, his he wins. His yeah. haiku is better than either of ours, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. So. Well, let's see how they compare to Mary Grace's. Ooh. Mary Grace says, Dear Carswells, I hope you're doing well. Thanks for reading my haiku on the last episode. Ah, a quick question. Are you still doing secret words? I was wondering when someone would yeah, ask. Yeah, so we need to, I need to say something. We haven't done one in a while. We didn't, we didn't get a lot of response for a while, so we just decided to leave it out instead yes. of, um, because we, we, what happens is we decide on a secret word and then we forget to we use forget it. We forget to use it, yeah. And, um, so, you know, it was fun while we did that, but mm -hmm. if, I think we had one that we didn't get a final guess on or, or maybe yeah, we Yeah, we just cut, yes. It, I think it was just, we weren't really getting a whole lot of participation. And, and, so. and by the way, note to David Bigwood, he sent, yes. he sent me a, uh, he, he sent me a note guessing the secret word uh, this past week, and I need to respond, I need to reply to you, David, but, um, but yeah, we haven't had one for a while, so, um, so I yes. guess you were just noting that there's certain words we tended to say a lot in that particular yes. episode. Yeah, speaking of David Bigwood's 
No, he says, um, secret word is either three or nine. Right. I'll guess nine. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes on, he says, the nine walkers were mentioned as opposition to the nine riders by Elrond, and the nine walker, walkers shall be set against the nine riders. Um, so yeah, no, uh, no secret word, guys. Sorry. If you really, really, really want to want us to bring it back and you guys promise to participate then you know we'll consider it yeah but well, um it just didn't seem to be it was kind of a novelty i think well, we, the, we did lots of people participated for a while and then right um, that's what i'm saying i think kind of the interest waned a bit so. yeah which is okay i mean that's i know fine. we, yeah, were, totally. we were a little off and on with episodes for a while there and um yeah uh but hey if you want to Maybe we'll have a secret, secret word where it's like we're not even telling you if we have a secret word, but you can guess it. And if you guess it, then, then you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> then you're awesome. You get bragging rights. We're not even gonna admit that we have a secret word, but if we do and you guess it, then it's like, then it's like a virtual high five. Then you can give yourself a self five. Hmm. I don't know if that's enough of a draw, but okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, without further ado, here are Mary Grace's haiku. The hobbits return to Bree. Almost a happy ending, but not yet. Mm. But not yet. Good stuff. Not Are you going to read yet. your second one? Yes. The world has grown strange. Frodo returns. He has changed, but so has his home. Hmm. Very nice. Very, very nice. Well, well done. done, Mary Grace. Our listeners win, for sure. Yes, definitely. Hands down. Better than us. Way better. Um, also, a quick shout out to Pear Brenner. Yes. He um, he and his family took a month long. He calls it an expected, an ex a most expected and amazing journey for the month during the holidays. They went to New Zealand, and he attached some photos of their trip. Most right of them, I think, on. from um, Hobbiton. And it's they're just they're awesome. Can I just say they are so awesome? Can I just say what? Lucky. I know, right? Totally. Um, what I love is that they just, they like, they're, they're his kids. Like, <laughs> first of all, they're super cute. Like, super cute kids. But they just seem like they, like, they they all feel so at home. I like, know. It's like they belong in Hobbiton. That's right. That's right. Um, so I, so thank you to Pear for um, sharing some pictures of your journey. It, it just looks like they had an amazing I know, amazing I know. Time. I can't even... It's very cool for us to be able to yeah. to see these things. Yeah, and, uh, to live a bit vicariously. I, I, we, I, owe, I owe Pear a response. Um, I need to send him a note. I, I sent Thank him you. a note, too. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it just looks like they just, they had a fabulous time. Yeah. And uh, thank you for giving us this little glimpse into your amazing adventure. And into the, uh, and into the Shire. Yeah, into the Shire. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so cool. It's really, really cool that you can go and visit I'm wondering, there. did he, does he say in here what the, the mountain is? Is it, is it Mount No, Dale? I don't think he mentioned Or no, it's the Lone, that's right. It's the, I, I, I said, I think it's the Lone, I think it's, um, uh, um, not Derry, but, uh, the, the Lonely Mountain. What, what do you call the Lonely Mountain? Mm-hmm. Which, speaking of Can't which... Can't we just call it the Lonely Mountain? Well, yeah, but it's got a proper name. Oh. Hmm. My Lonely Mountain. A.K.A. Erebor. There we go. Oh. Erebor. Yeah. Erebor. So, it's... Uh, I think that's the Lonely Mountain. Which, I love the picture because it's got, like, the little cloud halo above it, you know? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. That's an awesome mountain. Um... Yeah, I hope we can go to New Zealand someday. I would love to go to New Zealand. <clears throat> I would absolutely love it. New Zealand's like one of those places in the world that I'm like, you know, but you know, there there's New Zealand and then there's Switzerland. Like I think of those two places and I'm like, I'm so jealous of the people who were born there. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> like you get to live there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with Switzerland, it's actually really hard, I think, to emigrate there. You can't even. There. Yeah, it's really hard. You have to like marry. Almost... You have to marry somebody who's right. who's from Switzerland to get. Yeah. Swiss citizenship. Right. Um, right. But, uh, yeah. So that's, yeah, very cool pictures. Thank you for sharing yes, them with thank us. thank you, Pear. That was awesome. And, um, yeah. So any, is that, that the extent of our correspondence this time? Yeah, I think so. We had a few haiku that got sent in a little late from our, for our last episode. We had a um, couple from Matt and um, a couple from Josh as well uh, right. that we didn't get in time, but I sent them on to Josh and hopefully they're cool up on Twitter. 
Very nice. So, yeah. Very nice. Well, thank you guys for writing in. I always love hearing from y'all. Yes, we do. Yes, mm -hmm. we do indeed. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, next time we will discuss Book 6, Chapter 8, The Scouring of the Shire. Uh, send us your haiku. And I think that's all we got. Yeah, I think that's a wrap. All right. Thanks again to our patrons, Y'all Rock, executive producers, Dr. William Hutton and Justine Lloyd, as well as Shannon Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, <clears throat> James Applegate, Caitlin Fasista, Matt Scarence, Al Taylor, Per Brenner, James Lindbergh, Chris Loftus, Lawrence McGowan, Richard Wall, and Spencer Foger. We appreciate you all as Very well as much. all of our listeners. And we will talk at you next time. Yes, we'll be here. All right, thanks guys. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes. And consider supporting us financially via patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. On our next episode, we'll continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 6, Chapter 8, The Scouring of the Shire. Please send correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.